So good afternoon or, or good morning to all of the attendees of this webinar. I have the uh, great, uh, my name is Alfio Quarteroni and the great honor and the privilege to inaugurate this, uh, say, online version of the MOX colloquia with uh, Professor George Karniadakis. Uh, first of all, I want to thank him for accepting to, uh, to talk and uh, to talk uh, so early for, for, uh, for him. It's uh, 8 uh, a.m. indeed in uh, uh, the East Coast of the United States. Uh, George, uh, George Karniadakis is the Charles Spitz Robinson and John Palmer Basto Professor of Applied Math at Brown University. Uh, he's also a research scientist at MIT. Uh, he's a AAAS fellow, he's fellow of SIAM, he's fellow of the American Physical Society, fellow of the American Society of, uh, of Mechanical Engineers, he's associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and astronautics, and as you see, is a clear, clear indication of his scientific versatility uh, and recognition, of course. Uh, he, he received the um, um, from Humboldt Award, a very prestigious award uh, in, in Europe, the uh, Ralph Kleinman Award from Cyan, the, the Tinsley Oden Medal, the CFD Award by the US Association in Computational Mechanics, and many others. Uh, Professor Karnadakis is, uh, is an inventor and, and an innovator in the broad field of uh, applied math and, uh, say, large-scale computing or computational physics at large. Um, he's, he's famous for his seminal work on many different and many diverse fields. And let me just mention some of them. Uh, uh, the spectral elements on tetrahedra, the multi-scale modeling of biological systems, uh, the, uh, uh, so-called dissipative particle dynamics, uh, the, uh, the numerical solution of stochastic differential equations, the uh, quantification uncertainty with polynomial chaos, the fractional PDEs. Uh, now, uh, uh, his, his most recent patient is uh, uh, machine learning for scientific computing and he coined, he coined the, uh, the definition scientific machine learning. And uh, uh, this means basically how to solve and even discover uh, new partial differential equations or existing partial differential equations via deep learning. I think this is indeed a great, 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 great challenge. So last but not least, uh, let me, let me uh, remind you that uh, uh, George is from Crete uh, in, in Greece, and this is a place that means so much for, for the entire human civilization. Um, today, his talk is on uh, physics informed neural networks PINN, an alphabet uh, of algorithms for uh, diverse applications. So thank you very much, George, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alfio. Thanks for hosting me here. I see uh, lots of participants, lots of uh, familiar names. Uh, glad to be with you. I would I prefer to be with you in person, but uh, Milano is great. I was there in uh, Italy in Pisa in September, I drove around in Tuscan country and uh, see, and I had a great time just before the lockdown, but uh, here we are, what is recovering, I hear, it's great. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, look, of course. Up, look okay, yeah. Uh, and... Um, yeah, we see it perfectly. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to go there. <sighs> How do I escape now from there? Uh, maybe I can stop sharing my screen for a second. Give me a second. Uh, Any difficulty? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, I just want to go. My, my screen has, is stuck to. Okay. Maybe under this. Okay. I don't want that. Okay, this one. Can you see my screen now? No, not yet. Not yet, okay. Because I need to share it again. Sorry about the trouble. Um, Maybe the organizer of the meeting should give George the right to share the screen. Uh, okay, now we see the slide. Okay. Great. 
great. You can start. Thank you very much, uh, Alfie, and thank you very much, Luca, for accommodating me. Um, so I, um, uh, I, I'd like to start my talks on um, neural networks and uh, uh, with, with this picture, and I actually use it uh, in our science paper that gave visibility to, to this type of methods uh, uh, for, for, for the following reasons that um, uh, Leonardo uh, used a lot of observations, a lot of data. He was not taking videos, obviously, but he painted this. I, um, I came to understand a lot of his painting sketches in fluid mechanics. The first one actually is owned by the Queen. Um, uh, and then, and then the uh, lower one, which uh, I will show you some results later. Um, there's more than a hundred uh, copies of it, uh, but but uh, where the plate flow past the plate in this expansion has different orientations, different angles, and obviously he was trying to observe all the vortices and so on. Now the question I will pose today, and that's sort of from the fluid mechanics, I will I will touch on other disciplines is. Um, if you just have flow visualizations like that, can you extract quantitative information? For example, uh, can we find the pressure field? Can we find the velocity field and so on? Obviously a mathematically ill-posed problem, but I would like to pose that question. So, so I want to contrast also that, what is going on in scientific machine learning, what, what I'm pushing and other people are pushing uh, versus this type of artificial intelligence. I mean, I, I like, Cuts and, and so on, but, but this has been like extremes. For example, here they use uh, generative adversarial networks to create all these cuts that don't exist. More, more uh, over 15,000 of them. Uh, and then there's also art. Uh, this, I don't know if you've seen that, but this was the first um, uh, painting that was sold at uh, Christie's in auction uh, for over $400,000. And the artist is uh, the loss function of generative adversarial networks, which is right in the bottom. So these are great things, and I, I um, like to read about them when I, but when I um, have time. But but I like to promote artificial intelligence for science, AI for science, and machine learning. So there's plenty of beautiful pictures. Although this one is has uh, tremendous uh, consequences. This is the hurricane that destroyed Bermuda. And the question again here, just to pose it like the one that I posed for Leonardo's paintings is, can we extract pressure information? Where's the low pressure? We can see it, but what, how low is it? Can we extract the velocity and so on just from this video? So again, it's an ill-posed problem, no boundary conditions. Uh, uh, we don't know the full equations and so on, and, and, and that would be part of, the, um, of what we're talking, discovering um, an inverse problem, so hybrid problem. So, uh, just to make the, the problem a little simpler, something that I can appreciate because I've been doing flows past the cylinder since I was a student at MIT. We built a spectral element around that, this flow. So I'm asking the question, actually one of our reviewers in science asked, what happens if you have strict lines around the cylinder? Can you discover the pressure field, the velocity field, and in fact the forces on the cylinder? Imagine that this is a bridge, right? And you have visualizations or any, smoke visualization or dye visualization, can you just uh, get quantitative information? How accurate could that be? So that's one of the first questions we'll ask. Can we compute the body forces based on flow visualization only? Um, another question in, in solid mechanics is um, uh, in non-destructive evaluation materials, you do some test ultrasound and so on. I'll show you that. But let's say you just have this plate and, and uh, you don't want to destroy it, you just uh, pull it in a uniaxial or biaxial direction, and you have uh, sensors only at the edges, at the boundaries. Can you discover that there is a void or even an inclusion? What the size, what the shape, and so on? Clearly, that's a very difficult problem in finite elements. Uh, it's an ill-posed problem. It's a, you don't know the topology. You don't know uh, the properties of uh, that inclusion, for example. So I will address that later. So, so pins. We introduce pins not because speckled methods or other good methods or uh, like Boltzmann or all this uh, uh, multitude of, of, of methods that we have developed, uh, the community has developed over, over many years, 50 years plus, uh, they're not good. They're very, very good methods. However, when it comes to 
um, real problems. Uh, we used to solve problems with, uh, with like this box on the left. Um, and at this point, let me ask, you see my, clearly my, my screen and can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes perfect. Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you, yeah. yeah. So, so we used to solve these problems so with lots of physics. In other words, we know the, the mathematical formulation of the problem. We know the boundary conditions. So the small data would come, for example, from the boundary conditions and so the boundary conditions exactly where we want them. Not exactly where the measurements are, but where exactly we want them. Then we have the other extreme on the right. I'll use here my cursor. I don't know if you can see my cursor right here. But in, in, we don't have uh, physics, like for example, you know, Facebook, social networks and so on. We don't have physics yet anyway, but we have lots of data. But more often than uh, not, what we actually have in practice is, is some, somewhere in this picture here. Uh, we have some physics, most of physics, some physics, uh, we don't have black boxes, we have maybe gray boxes, or we have most of the physics, but either we cannot resolve the physics, like in turbulence, or we miss some terms, like in reactive, in reactive transport, we never know the reactions exactly. And we have some data. Now, I, was, I work a lot with the Army, and the Army gave me this 5D law. They say their data are not perfect, they're dinky, which means very small. They're dirty, which means noisy. They're dynamic because they're streaming video. And they're deceptive because, and they're deceptive because they're Russians and Chinese everywhere. Sorry about, about the, the, this comment, but it's not my comment. So, so I have to work with, with this type of data, which are imperfect, multi-fidelity. And at the same time, I have also to, to, to use my physics to incorporate the fact that I don't, I don't have a lot of data. I have to learn from small data. So that's sort of the idea behind behind teams, I'll show you that in a, in a second. But, but let me start with, um, uh, with this uh, fundamental theorem of Saipenko, 1989. He was professor, assistant professor at the time at Tufts University. This was the time where people were actually concentrating more on the math of this method rather than um, this hype that exists now with the hardware and so on. But basically this, this fundamental theorem of universal approximation says that neural networks can approximate even with a single layer, they can approximate a single layer here. They can approximate a function uh, uh, using uh, this uh, type of, uh, of linear basis, which, however, is um, uh, is uh, the argument to a sigmoid here or a non-polynomial, uh, uh, what is called activation function. And and by you can increase the accuracy to go to arbitrary level if you have a lot of, um, of layers. Now, it turns out that the theorem is only the approximation theorem. In neural networks, we have two more important uh, uh, errors. So that is the generalization error, uh, how you go from one case to the other, how uh, dense is the space that you're sampling, and then also the optimization error, the fact that we have to uh, find an optimum of a, um, a loss function, which is non-convex in high dimensional space. Uh, nevertheless, there were many fundamental um, theories in, uh, in the early 90s. And let me also mention here my collaborator, Sushi Hezmaskar, who has done quite a bit of, of work and then the seminal work by Ornick and Barron. Maybe there's a lot of noise in the background. I don't know if, if people want to, to close their microphones so that, uh, uh, that, that will help it. Uh, oh, I don't know if, if Luca can mute uh, the, the participants because I hear a lot of noise. Anyway, uh, I, th th this is what this, the theorem says. Uh, uh, Alfio, Luca, I, I hear a lot of noise in the background that is I, it's very distracting. I don't know if, uh, if Luca can actually mute the people. Luca, can you mute everybody? Okay. Um, uh, sorry. Can you mute people? There's noise in the background. I think now, now it's, yeah. so it's, it's good. Yeah, um, yeah. So, thank you. Thank you. For, so, so, so what I'm showing here is, is um, I'm asking the question how the neural network, standard neural network will learn a function. So we go inside, we, we manufacture this function so it has a discontinuity it has a low frequency component and then has a higher frequency component. Here on the, on the right, we show 
the um, Fourier transform. Let me just go back and, and play the movie again. So what you can see is that the neural, we go inside the neural network, every epoch, every iteration, think of every iteration. As you can see, we first learned the discontinuity, surprisingly, then we learned the low frequency and then the high frequency. We're used to low frequency, high frequency, but not this discontinuity. And if you can see here the Fourier spectrum on the right, so again, this is a Fourier spectrum of this function on the fly as we go through this, um, uh, Fourier, the, this iteration, the back propagation. Uh, and you can see the, the, the frequencies that learn faster. Then, then you have this very, very long tail associated with the discontinuity, which we learn first, as you can see here. Then we learn the low frequency, we learn the high frequency, and then the neural network returns back to the discontinuity. As you can see, this point here is moving, and that's the long tail spectrum and so on. So it's a kind of insightful, and one of the, one of the issues right now is, is un understand and explain the latent space of neural networks. Uh, you can do it with, with autoencoders, you can do it with, uh, with uh, standard mathematical analysis, going into every layer and find out what's going on, because I think that's, that's very insightful and how you design your neural networks and so on. Now, pins in physics inform neural networks uh, try to put together what I told you, the observations of Leonardo, uh, the neural network I just showed you, which is a function approximation and physical laws. I, uh, just to give you a heads up, uh, I um, talked about this function approximation and I will show you a lot of applications just to show the diverse applications of this. Pins has now gone viral. Uh, there's lots of companies. The Department of Defense is soliciting new uh, solicitations on all sorts of areas because based on pins. Uh, it's been crazy, you will see, because it's very, very simple. But what I want to show you today is something, something uh, more interesting intellectually anyway, uh, that we can use neural networks to approximate functionals and also operators. That will be the second part of my talk. In the beginning here, I'll show you some stuff on, uh, on pins. So, so, so as I said, we put together data, neural networks, and physical laws, how we do it. This is a basic sketch. Uh, so what you see here is a neural network on the left. So I'm trying to learn a function just like before, u, which is a function of space and time. The input is coordinates. The output is u. If I have labeled data, then it's, this is a very, very simple network. I have a simple minimization of the misfit between the data uh, and, the, and the neural network predictions in every iteration. So I take this back, the misfit. I change these connections, which will be basically my weights. These links are basically weights and biases. Uh, sigma is what I show you, this activation function that makes the approximation traces nonlinear. Then I'm done, basically. Uh, it's very, very simple uh, today is with... Uh, uh, with TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Keras, and all these other frameworks, you can do that in, in, in two minutes, actually. Now, uh, however, here we, in science, as we, uh, we know, we don't have a lot of data, because here you need 10,000 labels. With, so we don't have a lot of data. So we go to physics. So what we do, we couple this other neural network. What you see here in this box is another neural network, which basically takes derivatives of you. Uh, it could be time derivatives, could be space derivatives. Here, for example, I have a nonlinear Schrodinger equation, parameterized, lambda one, lambda two, maybe uh, unknown, for example. And I incorporate also that into a loss function, a mean square error. I, so I want the residual of this fu function. Think of the residual based method that uh, we use in finite elements. So I want the residual f of that to be zero. So f minus zero. Uh, evaluate it at the many, many points, and f is the number of points uh, for which we want to, to, to enforce the physics. And then I can take the first mean square error on the data. So this is the data, and this is the, the physical laws, the constraints, basically both constraints for this neural network. Uh, and because they, we share the same space, then I can weight them differently. So I can have a weight here, I can have a weight there. These are sort of details. But one thing I, I, I don't want to forget is that, in, how do I get this? Well, in today's world and, and with TensorFlow and, and, uh, and Julia and so on, we can actually differentiate the, this, this neural network. We don't have to do uh, finite difference. We do not have to do finite elements or even, even spectral elements. So all this is done using automatic differentiation. We remove the tyranny of the grid. Of course, these terms have to be evaluated, but it could be evaluated at random points or 
points that you select at will or care, care feelings, uh, space, uh, uh, um, strategies, whatever, but, but we're not building a, a grid. And as you know, the real applications are very, very important. So this space here and this space, and by space, I mean the space of unknown weights, unknown biases, these are basically the parameters that you, uh, that you try to find by doing this optimization. So after you write down the loss function, you're basically done. So I want to give you an example. So this is the Berger's equation that, that we're all familiar with, the viscous Berger's equation. So I don't know if you can see my code here on the right. It's a very small code, piece of code. Uh, so the first sentence, the first statement here defines the neural network in TensorFlow. TF stands for TensorFlow. It defines this left part here that I talked about. So it's one statement that defines the whole neural network. It's as simple as that in TensorFlow. Then we need to take the derivatives of u. So we, we define the neural network, then we take the time derivative, the space derivative, then we add up to get the residual f. And then I add them up, I send it to an optimizer. It could be uh, Adam optimizer, it could be many optimizers by optimization methods that Google and Facebook are using. And then after you do that, you have to evaluate all these terms at nf points. The nf points are points inside the space time domain. I don't discretize space, I don't discretize time, these are continuous variable. Now notice that the first term where I have the boundary conditions and the initial conditions, I took lots of points for initial conditions. For boundary conditions, I take random points. So I don't have to have, you know, everywhere um, boundary data. In fact, I don't have to have boundary data, it turns out, because this is an optimization problem. It's not the way we lax uh, thought about setting up this type of problems. But you can see the solution here for somebody who doesn't know fluid mechanics or, or, or CFD and so on. Um, that was my postdoc, uh, was working on this, my Maja Raisi. Uh, he got the solutions very quickly with very good accuracy for the Berger's equation with uh, minimum effort. So, so why, why pins are very popular? Well, as you can see, first of all, the code is so short and so easy, even professors can program now. The students like it because um, uh, the, the, you know, they can get the results right away. And then all, all the industry likes it because it's very simple and um, they can adopt it to different problems. Now, going back to the fundamental issue of how neural networks learn, I told you before that if I were to learn a function, let's say f of x, which has these five or 10 modes here, uh, and if I plot the number of iterations to learn each frequency, you can see the number of iterations here increases for higher frequencies. Now, if I were to solve this equation, the Poisson equation 1D for the same thing, and the right-hand side is now the function, if I look at how the neural networks learn, you can see here I change the, the learning mode of neural networks. So pins and change that learning mode in the sense that I learn all the frequencies uh, as I like it. Uh, and the reason in this particular case is, 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 is that is because naturally when you solve FFx, there's a weight like k square k is a wave number that comes naturally. So it weighs the higher wave number fast, makes them more important. So you can see now the, the importance of weight when you put the physics together with the data. So if, you are if you're doing optics, for example, I did with uh, Luca De Negro uh, recently, uh, an Italian from uh, who works at Boston University in Optics Express, uh, and we were looking at frequencies five megahertz, we were able to manipulate the weights in the loss function so that we can target exactly that, that range of frequencies. So that's also very important, very simple observation. Let me go through this application I talked about before. This is a hyperelastic material, which means it deforms a lot. And, uh, and I have this hole, I don't know that there is a hole. And I saw the inverse problem. Where is the hole, how big it is, what's the orientation and so on. I will not go through the statistics, the, uh, all the math, but you can tell. So, so here, this is an inverse problem. I have some data, the data is basically displacement uh, on the boundary, and from that, I can find um, where the hole is. Uh, I, let me just play this movie again. Uh, so what I'm, I'm doing here, I parameterize. I know that it's an ellipse actually. So, so I, here I find all the parameters. I find the modules of elasticity, the Poisson ratio uh, with just 10 sensors per edge. And uh, you, can, you can detect down to, um, uh, to about um, five microns resolution of void. You can have multiple ones. Uh, here's a real test that we did for a DARPA hackathon um, uh, for a project that I have with DARPA. These are real data from Air Force. 
uh, on the ultrasound, what you see here is an ultrasound on the left. And there's a crack, a surface crack somewhere here. Uh, and, um, and here we train pins on the right. But we wanted to characterize totally the crack. Uh, when, when the wave hits the, 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 the defect, you can see there's lots of refractions which you have to resolve. It's not easy to resolve this because of the fidelity of neural networks, but we developed adaptive activation functions to do that. And that's how we won this hackathon. We were the only team out of, of 10 teams that we win that. Not, not only that, we use this um, acoustic equation here. Uh, so we could find the, the, the speed of sound, the velocity here, uh, which is constant away from the crack, but it changes at the, right at the crack. So by actually having that, um, so we, in this problem, we are using the data to find this function C of X and Y. If you have that, you can totally characterize the surface crack. So the paper that was just uh, reviewed uh, with very good comments from people in the field, non-destructive evaluation. Uh, we use a few teasers, so to speak, in our science paper to show uh, the capability of this. So let's say uh, you, you're looking at the flow past the cylinder. You don't even know that there's a cylinder there, but somebody gives you uh, dye visualizations in this arbitrary cut, this flower. So think of this, you have snapshots, 10 snapshots of this in time. And can you infer the velocity field there and the pressure? Not everywhere, but just where we have a dye and therefore gradients of the passive scalar. So you can write the Navier-Stokes equation as a Navier-Stokes uh, flow network like that, coupled. Now all these equations here, including the, the incompressibility, um, uh, is can be incorporated very easy to incorporate constraints, as you can tell. And these results show that indeed you can uh, infer the pressure uh, and the velocity field with an accuracy with about two to 5% accuracy. Now, for this case, you cannot infer the forces because there's nothing going there. But if you actually do this experiment, um, just like in Van Dyck's album of fluid motion, that they have this picture, some, one of the reviewers sent us this, says, can you do that? So we, we set up synthetic data simulation uh, uh, using virus um, or Neumann boundary conditions. So we're able, just from the flow visualizations, to infer the lift coefficient, as you can see here, and also the drag coefficient with accuracy better than 10, 5% error at most. So uh, this is low Reynolds number and so on to make a, a point, but, but we have done Reynolds number 10,000 and so on. Uh, so the idea is, again, you use the data indirectly. We call it hidden fluid mechanics here because it's like hidden Markov process you're not looking at the real data, you're looking at the auxiliary data and you infer the primary data, which is the velocity and the pressure. This is another application I used to solve this with spectral elements, but not the inverse problem. So the inverse problem here is um, we want to find out what the wall shear stress is uh, given uh, this visualization, what you have uh, from the doctors. Uh, they, they inject this the contrast agent, this dye, and you can see here inside the brain aneurysm, this is the brain aneurysm, the real geometry from Children's Hospital from, from Boston. You can see that there is motion, but you cannot really see, you cannot really extract any uh, wall shear stress at the wall. That uh, would be very, very difficult with standard methods. So what we do here, we actually take a domain, only the, uh, the aneurysmal sac. We don't have to take, for this inverse problem, we don't have to take the whole domain. We just take this 3D domain. This is actually synthetic data, so we can compare, but it's very close to what happening in reality. And again, we can infer both the velocity field and the uh, pressure field with 5% accuracy. If I plot, if I make this movie, you can see it's just a visual evidence, but there's more in the appendix of the science paper, quantitative visualization. But you can see we learn the flow inside. Therefore, we can learn both the um, viscous stresses as well as the pressure, and then uh, infer where the wall shear stress is and what it is and so on, just from the dye visualization. Uh, recently, we found this on the web, is La Vision. It's a company now we are working with them, but at the time where I just took this video, I gave it to my postdoc and says, can you infer the velocity and pressure field from the mouth of, of this man? And uh, sure, uh, sure enough, he, he was able to uh, compute the, uh, to infer the, I shouldn't say compute, but infer the pressure and the, and, and the velocity here with and without the mask. Turns out the velocity with the mask is 10 times smaller than the velocity without the mask and so on. So you can compare this against other methods like stochastic flow and so on. But uh, our method continues because we use as a background the Navier-Stokes equation. Going back to Da Vinci's problem, 
Of course, I only have one snapshot. He didn't paint the same thing many times, just one. It was a sort of steady state. So, so I wanted to create a video of it. I multiplied by some time function and I was able to infer the velocity field and the pressure field just from the dive visualizations. Again, just to put the, the, the concept. So, uh, so that was kind of the beginning. Then um, I've looked at a big group now and, and everybody was wanted to do something different. Can you use um, pins to do conservative high speed flows? Yes, indeed, we, we did shocks. We actually have shocks involved, uh, shocks with one point because of this um, adaptivity, the, the built-in adaptivity that uh, neural networks will do and pins in particular will do. Variational pins where you can use a variational Galerkin, vari like Galerkin, or Galerkin type methods or functionals to minimize instead of the loss function. In time, stochastic pins, I'll show you a slide. We can use generative adversarial networks, uh, large eddy simulations using pins, non-local to find kernels, non-local kernels, extended pins, and so on. So there's lots of, uh, just to give you um, a highlight, the stochastic pin is based on, uh, on, on GANs. GANs is one of the most important neural networks developed uh, in the last 10 years. By Ian Goodfellow, he, he used to be at Google Brain. Neuro, he's actually a neuroscientist from Stanford, not a computer scientist. Came, this, came up with this idea that the neural network, the discriminator here, will learn faster from small data if you have a generator that is actually um, is antagonizing him. So it's a, it's a game theory, two players play, playing against each other. The generator is trying to create uh, fake data using real data and noise. Discriminators using the real data, trying to discriminate if it's real or not, and then, and at the end the discriminator can is can learn much faster. This is an idea. This is a type of a, a semi-supervised learning which is very important. But we use it to solve stochastic PDEs and also to generate processes. Uh, this is just to show you how we actually do it. We have a generator, for example, if I want to solve this uh, classical problem of. Uh, of uh, porous media where you have a conductivity that depends uh, that is uh, stochastic and that the field is stochastic. The, the uh, right hand side is stochastic. The problem we want to solve is you have some measurements and some realizations of the right hand side and you have some measurements and some realizations of the conductivity. Can you solve this problem? With classical methods we cannot, we cannot do that because it's, it's like this hybrid problem. It's not an inverse, not a forward. So here we have a generator for the conductivity, a generator for the velocity, both are stochastic fields. This part here, the green part, encodes the differential equation. We feed the generator with, with noise data, but also data from the PDEs. And then we, we, the discriminator has to look at real snapshots, and also it has to generate snapshots so it can learn faster. One of the things we found, uh, and, and we pushed this um, physics-informed guns to more than 10,000 dimensions, is that as we increase the dimension, we don't get this explosive uh, case of dimensionality. Uh, but we have a cost, a cost which is almost quadratic, going, let's say, from 60 to 120 dimensions. The cost goes up like four times, four to five times, uh, including all costs, but not, not exponentially. Of course, that is known for standard neural networks. There's a proof now by Poggio and my collaborator, Mascar. They show that for because of the composition structure of the neural networks, you can actually uh, cure, cure, not treat, cure the, the cares of dimensionality if you have this compositional structure. So there's a theoretical paper on that. Uh, what is X-PIN? X-PIN is something like pins. We just came up with this idea. We haven't published it yet. Uh, it's under review. But a thing of this, uh, this domain, I can actually have arbitrary domains just like I show you. Uh, and the reason is because we, unlike finite elements, we don't, have, we don't need to have a Jacobian to map it. So this is pins. And, and the key idea here is, Unlike the discontinuous Galerkian and conservative pins where we were using the flux and the continuity of the function, here we abandon the fluxes. In fact, we impose continuity on the residual directly. And remember that we're trying to, to minimize the residual. So you can have all sorts of fun shapes uh, to, to do, do the, the composition. Not only that, every domain, every color of this do, uh, domain has its own neural networks. So for example, if you have a, a shocks here, you, you, you want to use a very deep neural network with few neurons, just like spectral elements. If you have a, this area here where it's very smooth solutions, uh, you can use a, a one or two layers with lots of neurons. So depending on the roughness of the solution, uh, on the stiffness of the problem. So that this is very good for multi-scale problems, of course. Uh, here's an example of a 3D Poisson equation. You can see the, the domain is decomposed into this uh, 
uh, cupcake type uh, things like with cookie cutters. So these are the domains. So in each domain, you can tune the neural network and of course do it simultaneously. And the only passing of data is not fluxes because fluxes will make it very difficult to find the interfaces. Uh, you just pass the residual from one side to the other, you penalize in the loss function. Variation pins is a kind of interesting, uh, certainly from the theoretical point of view. So you can do a petro -Galerkin. So the interesting thing here is that the space itself, the trial space, is the neural network. But uh, here, and because of my, my bias with spectral elements, I use test functions, which are Legendre polynomials and Jacobi polynomials. Turns out if you have uh, a sim simple, like, uh, simple test functions like sines and cosines, at least for one layer, you can write analytically the residuals that you're trying to, uh, to minimize, and you can see the different forms here. But one thing that you can observe is that the residuals you're trying to minimize are much, much different than anything else that you know in any other method. So this is really interesting to get some insight and how you impose boundary conditions. So, so this, is, uh, uh, this is really interesting area. You can do HP decomposition, you can do X pins with, with this and so on. So let me, this is sort of the first part of my talk. Um, uh, as, as you know, in finite elements, it took 50 years to come up with theories after the first simulations. So this, uh, this um, scientific machine learning is similar. Uh, there's a lot of ad hoc things that are going on, a lot of empiricism. Uh, my lab has become expert in, in, um, in trickery and uh, using, uh, using art to, to do all this stuff. But uh, recently, uh, one of the postdocs here and assistant professor uh, Jerome Darbon, I work, work with together, and we came up with a very solid theory, I think, on, um, on the convergence and generalization, in fact, of physics and formula networks. So we have now a rigorous theoretical footing for these methods. If I have time, I will show you some of the main steps. Uh, currently, we're working on an, an alternative. So this is based on, on um, successive minimizers and the Schauder uh, method uh, and the Holder type continuous uh, assumptions. Um, but, but it follows completely the, the, the physics and formula networks that uh, we propose. Uh, a similar way a similar approach, uh, uh, so a different approach for the same reason, for the same target, uh, was developed by one of my other students who uh, Han Zhang, who is professor at WPI, who used gamma convergence and uh, equivalence of norms to actually show the same thing um, on uh, both convergence and generalization. As I said, I will talk about it. But now I want to talk about something more exciting, and that is, can we approximate operators? And here, the reason I say, can we teach robots calculus is because I want to, to, to basically say that we can use neural networks to approximate not just functions, but any mathematical operator, but also any PD and any nonlinear PD. And how is that possible? Well, it's possible because two very, very smart people, and un, I would call them unsung heroes. Uh, I have one student uh, who works with me at MIT, and I ask him to ask his instructor of machine learning at MIT in course six, if neural net networks can approximate functional. And the professor said no. And then I asked, uh, and, and it turns out that this theorem by Chen and Chen from Fudan University exists in 93, 95. So I show this theorem here for, for, for nonlinear operators, but basically the theorem, just like the Saipengo theorem for functions, now this is for nonlinear operators. So it says that if you have a space V, which is a compact space, then any operator which is a nonlinear continuous operator can be approximated here with arbitrary accuracy using neural networks. Now, it doesn't say one neural network. You can see here there's actually two neural networks. This is one neural network for the operator, and this is another neural network for the output where this operator will be, will be evaluated, will be evaluated at the space of, of Y, so this becomes now a neural network. So we have an approximation theorem, a universal approximation theorem for operators. The same, the same people produce also earlier theorem for functionals, which is very, of course, very useful for engineering. So, so what is the setup? Well, G is actually a map. So I, I want to go from U, which is function. I want to go to G of U. And then if I, if I train my network many, many times, then you pull a function another function, unseen function, u from that space v, and then I have to predict the output, which is g of u of y. So schematically, 
we observe the function here, one function, and then I observe also g of u at a few points. Then I need another function, another function. So, so I have to build a neural network like that. So the input here will be a u function and will be the output y, and then I have to take the, the, the cross product and get g of u of y. In other words, I have to observe. Now, how you represent u itself is, is interesting, but you can use points, or you can use a neural network, or you can use a wavelet representation, or you can use a spectral representation to have functions to, to represent this, this space v. This space v is very important. How you represent it is very, very important. And then g of u, it turns out you don't have to represent it at so many points. So let's do a very, very, <coughs> and we'll do a simple example. But the, the main contribution from our group was actually to realize this theorem, because this theorem doesn't say anything about generalization error. And of course, can you, uh, op, can you solve this problem in terms of optimization? So, so we built this networks, which we call the branch and the trunk. So let me go to the D one. So you take one function, observe at M points, and, and you, you build this branch net, and then you have, you concatenate many functions, or you go one function at a time, but you, you want to learn to use this many, many functions. And then the trunk net is like that. The trunk net, is associated, which is this term, is associated with the output. And sigma here, again, is activation function. So let's uh, apply this to a very simple problem. Uh, you're looking at this ODE, but this can be interpreted as an integral. So I want to learn this integral from zero to x, and x could be anywhere between zero and one. So I train this neural network using u of t, here, I use a space V, which is actually not compact. I use a Gaussian process regression to represent my functions U of T. And I take 10,000 of those functions, but, but I represent the output. I observe the output, on although it's a function, I only observe it at one point, which is amazing, actually. And I have 100 points to, re <clears throat> to represent my function, but only one point to represent my, my output. And, as, and as, I, as I show here, the mean square error the training and the testing error. Testing means you give me a new function I have never seen before. I give you the integral, that's pretty good. Now, if I have my student spending another two weeks training it, I can get down to 10 to the minus 10 maybe. But here I compare different neural networks. This is the network I show you. The, training, the testing error is slightly above the training error as opposed to standard neural networks where the training error will be, the testing error will be twice as much as the training error. So, so generalization is very important. And now the issue becomes how you build new neural networks to approximate um, uh, operators and functions, in fact, so that you have, can have uh, good convergence. Now, something interesting that we observe in this problem, this problem now, u of t is the input. So we observe this excitation. So the input to this network is actually a function. The output is two functions here. So this what is like a couple pendulum. As you can see, it's nonlinear. But here I plot the mean square error versus training data for different neural networks. And you can see, let's, let's look at the middle one that has, uh, I don't remember how many layers, maybe four layers, that has a width, which means 100 neurons. What you can see here, the error drops exponentially fast. So we're learning this operator exponentially fast. G here, G here will be the map from U to S1, S2. So the, the spaces can, don't, don't have the same dimensionality. But I have exponential decay, as you can see. If I make the network smaller, this transition point, I lose exponential accuracy here. You can see it goes to back to algebraic, which is bad. But if I have a smaller network, uh, you can see that I have a smaller range of exponential uh, decay. If I have a bigger network, this point here, the transition point from exponential to algebraic convergence moves to the right. So there is a neural network out there but actually can learn exponentially fast this operator, which is tremendous, of course, because it's very difficult and more time consuming to learn operators. But nevertheless, we have seen that also for PDEs. This is diffusion reaction system. Uh, it's a paper that's on the archive. Uh, <clears throat> you can learn really difficult operators. For example, here, I like fractional differential operators. So I can go and learn the Caputo derivative. Um, <clears throat> Michel Caputo who popularized this um, derivative for initial value problems uh, <clears throat> by just put, taking lots of functions, computed <clears throat> this derivative, uh, the Caputo derivative with labeled data, minimize and so on, and, and, and learn, use this network to learn it. So I can learn, so this is the Caputo derivative here. 
you can see I learned it very accurately. I want to show you something really impressive. Uh, so one of the most difficult operators to work with, we wrote a paper on, with the title, what is fractional Laplacian 90 pages paper, is um, the fractional Laplacian on a bounded domain. So here I took a unit disk. Uh, it turns out on a unit disk, you can represent this function V, the function where you pull functions to input to the neural network using this uh, Zernike polynomial. Zernike polynomials are orthogonal polynomials like Jacobi polynomials on a disk. And you can see the hierarchy here. Actually, Zernike the, is an experimentalist who, who uh, got a Nobel Prize working on uh, uh, interferometry. But I can represent now the function <coughs> V using the Zernike polynomials. And actually, it turns out that I can represent very accurately my test error and my training error is very accurately for this Laplacian. Now, what happens? It's, it, it's very time consuming to learn the operator. But after you learn the operator, you can spit it out in a fraction of a second. So you don't, uh, as opposed to with these non local operators, it's really very expensive. So we learn fractional different operators. We can learn stochastic operators. Here you can see the standard of this operator. I can learn this, um, uh, let's say, for uh, white noise. We also a different way, but here I use color noise, so I use a Cartoon Loeb expansion. So my input space now is one plus five because I truncated my Cartoon Loeb to five, and then uh, then you have the output space is also changes with branch net and so on. But you can see here that I can learn actually the trajectories, not just the statistics, but I can learn the trajectories uh, of this stochastic operator. Now this is a Another example is a real example that the MIT student was doing. He um, comes from ocean engineering, so he was looking at the destroyer. And I hope you can see the movie. There's a destroyer uh, through a sea state eight with waves 20 uh, meters. So this is a simulation from open foam. One simulation like this takes 20, uh, sorry, 15 days uh, to complete because you have a spectrum of North Atlantic spectrum. You have a stochastic sea elevation. And you're looking at, uh, to, to, to find out uh, what are the, <clears throat> the motion, the six degrees of freedom of this uh, destroyer in the rough sea like that. So obviously, if you use CFD for autonomy, this is useless. So what you do, you pre-train the entire, using, using CFD data of this very complicated, the painstaking process, but only MIT students can do that because they're patient. So, so it, it took him six months to, we trained the network, but um, he was not working full time on it. But after he did, uh, he designed a uh, LSTM, which is a, a recurring neural network with, with some memory. And, and then the, the problem is the following. If you have a new stochastic elevation, a new C state, can you actually predict the motion like heave and pitch and so on? And you can see here, you cannot see the CFD. This is unseen data. You can see, we can predict what CFD does for the future. So data, so in other words, here's a catamaran. I train the catamaran here. I predict the catamaran. This is the heave and the pitch I, I predict here. And there you can see the motion is not sinusoidal, it's stochastic. So if you try to do that with POD or reduced order models, you cannot do that, of course, especially for long time integration. Even for short time integration, you can do that. So uh, how am I doing in time? Do I have a few more minutes? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, okay. so. I, I show you uh, some applications of pins which I rely on function approximation. I show you uh, the very uh, recent one, which is how you approximate functionals. The last one was a functional because I'm not looking at the entire state. I'm looking at, uh, at the, the motion as a function of time given a stochastic field as an input. And another, another important, uh, perhaps the most important uh, uh, aspect of this is to look at the mathematics. What exactly happens to pins? And neural networks in, in, in general, but pins in particular, because you have this uh, um, <coughs> regularization that, hap that uh, takes place with, uh, with PDEs, stochastic PDEs, also stochastic PDEs. There's a lot of ad hoc empiricism and so on. I, I already talked about uh, the convergence theorem, but there are other issues. There's this issue of um, of learnability and, and how, how small data set you can use to learn and so on. Uh, and then also what happens in this ill-posed problems, I didn't have boundary conditions and I could learn a field velocity field and pressure field. So this is a nice schematic to show, a schematic, I don't know if it's a nice schematic, we use the schematic a lot, some other people use it. 
so this space here is a space of neural networks okay now the truth solution is somewhere here and so the distance between the neural network space and the true solution that would be the approximation error that's what the Saipeco theorem will, will, will say, well, you can make this arbitrarily small. Yes, you can make this arbitrarily small, but you cannot make the generalization error arbitrarily small. And of course, doing non-convex optimizations in high dimensional space, the optimization error is never zero. In other words, you never have unique solutions. Uh, uh, so, so these are really difficult problems. So, so we start by saying, well, I'm gonna have a, a minimizer. So I'm looking at the loss function m will be the space and m will be the number of points where I evaluate my, um, my mean square error, my loss. Um, lambda will be some parameters, lambda r will be some parameters, the regularization that I will, I'll introduce. So I take a, a, a series of these minimizers and I want to see uh, to um, basically, I'm looking at the best approximation first and then I will assume, okay, I have 1 million gradient descent iterations and they're good methods in the literature. Um, uh, and then I want to see if this is true. Um, <clears throat> so, for, so what we did is to, to introduce, in addition to the loss function that we have, which is the, um, the physics, what we call the physics, and also what we call the, the boundary term, the boundary operator here. And these are just weights. MF is the number of points inside the domain. MB is the number of points at the boundary. We introduce this, this uh, regularization this regularization is in the in the holder sense, okay? So 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 it's a holder continuous. We we, we look at the holder continuous. Uh, that's the assumption here. So instead of minimizing the original problem, we want to minimize this. And then of course, if this uh, regularizer goes to zero, we have the original problem. So this is how we set up the problem. We don't have time to show you everything, but the first theorem says that if we have a training points being IID from probability distributions. Uh, new related to the interior domain, new B related to the boundaries here, as you can see, I say I have that my loss function in the pin is bounded from above from the regularized, the holder regularized empirical loss, plus this term. Now what this term is, is the number of points inside the domain. Alpha is the holder constant between zero and one, D is the dimensionality, and here's the point. It's not a very sharp, but, but we are working on, on sharper, but this is the first estimate and so on. Now we haven't proved uh, what we want yet. You have to do a lot of hard, uh, more work, but you need assumptions. Uh, you will see here some this assumption one, very strong and so on. It's only a paper, just give you a sketch. But now we have a theorem that says that uh, if these assumptions hold and the setup of the problem is this regularized uh, loss with MF is the number of points that we take, uh, then we have this, this loss functions converges, as you can see with this rate, okay? It's the worst case uh, rate of convergence. As I said, with gamma convergence and the equivalence of norm, we were coming up with sharper estimates, but we haven't published that paper yet. So this says that even without, without involving the boundary conditions, I have L2, uh, no, not yet. So let me specialize this, uh, I'll skip this Schauder approach, specialize this to elliptic and parabolic PDs. So having the usual assumptions for semi quasi linear equations, uh, we come up with a theorem that reads the following. There exists a unique classical solution to the elliptic PDs. Without satisfying the boundary conditions, we can have uh, convergence in the L2 sense. So even if you don't satisfy convergence in this spin framework, you get L2 convergence. Now, if I add the boundary conditions, let's say this is the boundary condition here, I, I converge, Pins converge in the H1 sense. So again, I encourage you to read that paper uh, um, on uh, pins in the archive. And uh, so I have a couple, if I have a couple more minutes, I talk about all the good things that are happening and I want to show you a really, really bad thing. And, and, and people in computer science kind of ignore that. Uh, in computer science, you use a, lo a lot the, the ReLU function. It's like a RAM function, right? So, uh, and Saipengo theorem that says there's nothing wrong with the ReLU function because it's non-polynomial, so you, you, it's great. In fact, it, I want to approximate this function absolute value of x, right? And from the approximation point of view, you can see if I take a ReLU to the right, left to the uh, zero, to non-zero, and then non-zero to zero, I can represent this function with just two neurons. 
two layers with width of two, I can represent exactly from the approximation point of view this function. So neural networks do a good job. Now, I ask my student to take a 10 layer LU with width two, use the best optimizers, use best uh, initializers, and here's what they found in practice. In practice, what, what happens is 93% of the, of, of the times, instead of the absolute value of X, they actually get this value, the average, the mean, okay? 7% of the time, they may get something like this, part of the branch and so on. So, as I said, it's not just the approximation error, it's also the generalization error. In fact, here, the optimization error. So we want to see what's going on. You say, well, this is a no-smooth function. It turns out that neural networks are very good at approximating LP functions. So it's not that sort of an issue. Here's a, here you can see another function uh, that's very smooth and sometimes, again, we, we approximate the average here and then we approximate branches most of the times and so on. Uh, and this is again for the ReLU function and we can do a lot of analysis with ReLU functions, uh, theoretical people and use like the ReLU function uh, and other functions and so on. But, so, so what's, what's happening? You say, well, the mean square error is not a good uh, loss function. Why don't you do the uh, mean absolute error? And it's true, sometimes the mean absolute error is good, but here with the mean, instead of finding the average, we find the median now using this. So again, you, you fail uh, miserably, not because of the approximation, but because of optimization, because nobody told you that you, can, you, you will convert. So, so we're looking at this, because everybody, especially when you go deep, Everybody says go deep because, because you have more expressivity and it's true, but they forget that there's also optimization. And then basically what happens, the ReLU network is a dying network. So you have to be very careful with that. So, so in the dying network, the mean state converges and basically stays where the initialization is. So we have a theorem before you even start training that says the following. If you take weights which are independently initialized and from a symmetric distribution, and the bias are either zero or drawn from a symmetric distribution, then we can prove that the neural network with L layers dies with this probability where NL is the number of neurons. So if, specifically, if we take the same number of neurons for all layers, then if I take the limit of this probability of the neural network to die as the depth goes to infinity, remember everybody says go, go deep young man. Well, that's not exactly right because the probability of the neural network to die if you have fixed neurons is, is one. On the other hand, if you fix the number of layers and take the neurons to infinity, consistent not, so with, uh, then you get uh, zero probability. So that's a, 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 a alive and kicking. Okay. Um, we have some other work that shows also for some cases we can uh, find the upper bound and the lower bound. Um, but I, I want just to show you this schematic to see what's happening. So this is like a phase diagram. Think of this as designing a priori neural network that will not die. So this is the number of hidden layers, the depth of the neural network. And this is the number of, of, uh, of neurons per layer. And you can see the safe region is here. In other words, unlike finite elements where we, I increase the number of, of uh, layers or the number of, of, of finite elements and I get convergence, here you will not get convergence because this network will collapse with, with the, if, if it's here. But if you increase at the same time as you increase the depth, if you also increase the, neur the, uh, the neurons, you can see you're in the safe region. So this line here is a theoretical line for 1% uh, probability for this neural network to die. Above that, it dies. This is the 10% probability. And you can see the exper our experiments and the theory are very close to each other. So one has to be very careful. And ReLU, as I said, is the most favorable, uh, is, the, is the one that is favored by computer scientists for classification. But they use usually massive neural networks. They don't care, and they, they throw uh, a lot of computational resources uh, shamelessly at all these problems and, and, uh, and trying to get 0.1% um, increase in accuracy. Well, this this fundamental problem of the network collapsing. Uh, so I'm, I'm done. Uh, for those of you who want to uh, dive into this, we have a library, Deep XDE. It's an educational library. There's a SIAM review paper that uh, will appear soon. It's been accepted and it's, uh, now in the proofs that um, it's in the educational part of SIAM reviews. So we explain step by step how this works, what's the difference between finite elements and these neural networks. But this library allows you to solve uh, uh, stochastic ODEs, um, integral ODEs, and PDEs, 
Uh, it allows you to have some complexity in the geometry also, uh, and so on. So it's a kind of a nice educational material, but it has been used a lot. It has uh, more than 20,000 downloads from uh, uh, GitHub. So I want to finish with this, um, this problem. So we are working on a, on a really a grand challenge problem. This company, La Vision, I don't know, Alfie, if you know them. They're in Germany, I think. They're also in no. um, So they, they do this. Um, Slidian photography and other visualizations. They do PIV and other visualization, but this is a Slidian photography. They took a 3D, <laughs> uh, 3D images of density gradients above the cappuccino, uh, and they asked us. Uh, actually, I, I first did the, the sneeze with them, and then I approached them. I said, "Can we give me this data?" And they gave me a 3D volume now, because I'm really, really interested to see how fast uh, my cappuccino get cold. And, uh, and this convection problem, okay? So I want to find out what's the velocity field and what's the pressure field above this. So we have shown the results of them. Uh, we work with, as I said, uh, I, I want to also say about something about NVIDIA. NVIDIA has now released a code called SIMNET, which will sell with their, their hardware. SIMNET is based exclusively on our pins, but the parallel code is very, very fast. That's all the things I told you that DeepXD does. Uh, ANSYS, as uh, a, a big group working on pins. I work with them. They, they fund a part of my research, so I have to disclose it. Um, uh, and other companies uh, were speaking, but the companies have. But let me go back to this, uh, because we did hidden fluid mechanics here, and I want to show you uh, uh, what happens. So we use the temperature only. Uh, we match it in here. This is 3D, but I just show you one slice. And then we get the pressure also. And for first time ever, you'll see what the velocity field is above your cappuccino drink. And um, as you can see, the special mug we designed has a neural network, the pin neural network there. Uh, let me play this movie again. Uh, really complex process, 3D natural convection going on. <laughs> it's unsteady. <laughs> so we can get the pressure here. You can see uh, the velocity field uh, going. OK, so this is just for fun. I just want to say that our work uh, is, is funded by um, uh, different sponsors. I have 12 postdocs in my group, very big group, um, uh, but we have to generate all this funding. The funding comes from DOE. This uh, center that I direct uh, is called FILMS, Physics Informed Learning Machines. We actually proposed this to DOE uh, four or five years ago, but it took them a while to realize it. Uh, it's a consortium. I'm the director. Uh, and then MIT, Stanford, Sandia National Labs, Pacific Northwest, and Santa Barbara are working on the, and uh, basically trying to expand uh, physics-informed learning in general, including Gaussian processes, other networks, but also uh, machine uh, neural networks in particular into this. And uh, with this, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I went, I went over probably the time limit, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much for hosting me. So thank you very much, George. Uh, it's a great talk. And uh, I'm sure the 139 other participants will join me to applause you. Uh, this is really uh, plenty of uh, new things and uh, very exciting uh, results and very stimulating uh, arguments. So the floor is open for discussion. And uh, in case uh, uh, people want to uh, uh, ask questions, uh, uh, please open your mic. Maybe I start with a minor question, uh, George, if you don't mind. Yeah. Plenty of yeah. questions, but I try to just read it myself. Uh, when, when you introduce your uh, kind of domain decomposition approach to, uh, to PIN, uh, yeah. you, uh, if I understand correctly, you are using the residual at the interface between uh, different PINs, uh, different domains for use different PINs. Yeah. And uh, can you somehow guarantee or, uh, or, or hope that you can get at the end a, a, a conservative type of solution in this way without imposing the fluxes? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, uh, I cannot guarantee actually, I, you know, in this business, you cannot guarantee almost anything. But, um, but I compare, I'm trying to find the, I compare with, um, we have some experience with conservative uh, uh, with conservative uh, pins, where we basically follow the, um, uh, the 
maybe this one. Uh, we, we follow the, the discontinuous Galerkin approach where we uh, use um, uh, both, we, <coughs> we impose continuity on, on the variable and also the flux. And, uh, and this works, uh, and you can always see that the error is larger at the scene, like in any domain decomposition method. It turns out, I, I guess you cannot see it, but, but, but uh, uh, we compare extensively. This, this is like we have only like two months experience with it, but we have uh, actually very easily repeated all the stuff that we did with C-pins for, uh, I, I have for shocks and, and so on. And we have found uh, that um, we get the right answer. Now, if I go uh, maybe at the, maybe some uh, discontinuous results which I had at the end. So, um, yeah, so we get, uh, can, can you see this slide here? Yes. The, the, uh, this is uh, solving the inverse problem, again, uh, from density gradient using C pins or using, uh, this is using C pins and pins and C pins. Uh, and, and if it's not conservative, you will not find the, the speed of, uh, the right speed of the shock, but with X pins we do. So, so, so what what do we do with um, X pins? We put a lot of points at the seams, and um, as you know, even Galerkin methods, which are not uh, conservative, if you if you have lots of points, uh, you you can have this continuity, but uh, you don't actually have conservativity. Uh, so. Uh, Sometimes like here, here, for example, we impose, in fact, we have to impose here uh, for pins. Pins alone would not work. So for pins, we had to, to find the right speed. We have to impose the global conservation law, uh, like the global conservation mass uh, as a constraint to the equation to find the, the right uh, shock speed. Otherwise we're getting, uh, so I, I doubt that X pins uh, preserves conservat uh, local conserva con sorry, conservativity property. I, I don't think it does, but I, I don't know. We haven't, we haven't had a chance actually to think why this works so well, actually, for all problems with, with uh, of course, if you have discontinuities, you, you, uh, you, know, you take the mean value just like, in, uh, because we impose all those so kind of C0, we're trying to impose C0, but but, but this is an arbitrary construct right now. The, the only thing that we observe is, this postdoc of mine observed that, that doing uh, continuous residuals uh, are really, really robust. Uh, in this business right now, Alfio, it's more like, is this a, a robust method? Would I give the results? Uh, it, we're not at the point now we can, you know, we can say, uh, you know, use this instead of DG or something like that. That's not, for inverse problems, I can say that inverse problems we solve much faster than, <laughs> than any other method that is out there. But for forward problems, I, I, would not, I would not claim anything at this point. No, but I, I must admit that this uh, solution is fantastic. I mean, you, uh, you, you, you can keep the shock in a discontinuity in a very sharp way. So this is really very, very impressive. And I, the second question would be uh, before someone would uh, uh, open their mic. Um, and uh, this is on, um, on your battleships still yeah. uh, uh, quite, quite uh, remarkable results. And uh, if I understood correctly, you, you say that you were, uh, you, it took a few months uh, to train the system, right? And then you reproduce this uh, CFD solution, which is so complicated in such a, such a short time. And my question is about the, uh, I don't know if you can call it robustness. I mean, if you change then the shape of your battleship, like how can somehow be, you, can you be confident that your trained solutions will perform well? No, no, the, 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 this is tied to, so, so the, um, the, the, the depot net that I mentioned and the, the deep functional net, it's uh, specific to the, to the geometry. If you change the topology okay. uh, or if you change the boundary conditions, for example, you have to do something else. So I have now a DARPA project where we're looking exactly at that. So can you, can you throw in some, in other words, they say, is this, uh, you know, can you generalize this? That's what you're asking. It's sort of transfer learning from one. Uh, so it, for, in terms of, in, in terms of uh, C states, I can go from C state one to C state eight in the training and I will be okay. But I have, if I go outside that range, I, I will not be able to capture the same thing for shapes. But what you can do is, let's say you have a shape which is uh, similar to this. 
you can um, uh, freeze, you can do some transfer learning uh, after you learn this network, uh, release like the last two layers, and then with new data, that, a few new data that you may have, you can complete, quickly get to the answer. Uh, and then the, and a, 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 a more robust approach to this is to actually um, introduce again physics informed terms, constraints in the PoNet at the operator level. In, and, and you can also do other symmetries, Galen invariance, all these things you can do that. We haven't done that yet. So we're working on that. That's actually the current project. We just started last week on, on doing that. How you can incorporate uh, constraints and prior knowledge, physical knowledge, physics laws, and so on into DepotNet so that you can make it um, uh, uh, to generalize. Right now, it's actually data driven only. Thank you. So the answer is no, we'll, not, we'll pay probably miserable. But, but for this, for this ship, um, if it doesn't change, going into Atlantic, so they, we trained for the Atlantic Ocean because you know every ocean has its own spectrum, uh, yeah. the, H1, the H1 half, the, what they call it, and so on. So if we yeah. want to go to, to Sicily and so on, Mediterranean, then, then we have to, to do another spectrum. But, but if it's the same sh ship, then we can deal with it. Is there any question from the audience, from participants? Hey, yes, I have, uh, oh, sorry. Have, uh, Christian? Yes, yes. Hello, I uh, activated my video, but uh, okay, it doesn't work. So, hello, George. Many thanks for your talk. I have uh, coming back to expand. Expand. I have a question about uh, the fact that if I well understood, the um, depth of the networks could change depending on the domain. Uh, That's right, yes. Because maybe you, you have a shock or not. This is something that uh, should be uh, chosen a priori, or there is a way to a posteriori to have a, a, a posteriori control and to adapt to the, the depth during uh, the, 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 the evolution of the dynamics, for example? Uh, uh, that's a very good question. We haven't done it, but uh, you can start with, um, you know, we can, we can start with a pin. And, uh, and, and very quickly, you can see, remember, remember the, the, the plot I show you, the, the, the um, learning the, this continuous function? Uh, the, the, the first thing we learn when we do this type of approximation, it turns out, and I think Jin Chao Xu has a um, good explanation why we get these sharp shocks. And, and uh, mm -hmm. you saw that the neural network attacks the discontinuity right away. So very quickly, we know where our discontinuities are. And then you and then on the on the fly you can actually do a, a domain decomposition, and then you can tune these networks. So I, I mentioned specifically that if we have a rough solution, uh, we um, we find uh, so we we did this um, it's called meta learning, but it's basically Bayesian optimization of, of hyperparameters where no the human is not involved. And what we found so it's an unbiased type of. So we, what we found is that when you have uh, rough solutions like uh, let's say Berger's right, in this is Berger's. The, the neural network, which is optimum, is a deep neural network with a few, few neurons. If you solve the Poisson equation, a smooth solution, the, the neural network is, the optimum neural network is probably two to three uh, layers with many neurons. So, okay. so that's kind of the intuition that we have. It's not, but, but, but uh, from this meta-learning type of studies, optimization studies of this. So, but, but the domain decomposition gives you this flexibility. Not only that you can do this in parallel, which of course is a, is a huge deal. And uh, we're working with NVIDIA, as I said, has this parallel co code already. But, uh, but you can tune the networks independently, which, and you can do it on the fly, yes, to answer your question. You can actually do it on the fly. You can change the neural network because you can interpolate from one instance, from one epoch to the other as, as you go through. Uh, so we haven't exploited all this yet because uh, these are new developments. We try to do it with C pins, and uh, Los Alamos National Labs have picked up this, and they do. Um, okay. Uh, they have a parallel code on C pins, but not on X pins. X pins is much easier to parallelize. You only pass the residuals, which is tremendous, actually. And um, and anyway, yeah. But I I'll, I would be interested. If somebody comes up with theoretical work on on X pins. The paper is not on the archive yet because it's so <laughs> simple. We didn't want to, <laughs> to spill the pins, right? <laughs> so this is the first time actually that I present X pins here to this uh, in the seminar. I, I didn't show it to the, to the EPH uh, because I, we were not ready yet, but uh, it's very, very, very fresh. Thank you. I, I see there are two Thank you. Uh, hands raised. Uh, one is Luca Dede and the other is Paolo Antonietti. 
hello George, uh, I'm Luca Dede. Uh, I yes, Luca. Thank, you. thank you very much first for uh, your very interesting talk and visionary uh, 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 guidance. And uh, um, my question is related to the variational pins that uh, yeah. you, uh, you have introduced. So if I understand yeah. well, you have the possibility to basically to choose the trial space uh, in virtue of the neural network and then uh, you choose, you have the freedom to choose the, the test space uh, on, uh, uh, in a conventional fashion, let's say. Um, uh, what is the advantage that uh, you find in this context? With yes, this it's a very good question. We're trying to evaluate this and, and, and see what we can do, but uh, you know, from a theoretical point of view, it's kind of interesting. So, so this is a Petrogalerkin approach, right? So, so you have two different spaces. But we want, we like, we like the nonlinear approximation. We like the nonlinear approximation. And Jin Chao Shu has shown that um, basically, uh, and that also relates to the previous question about the shock, how would Something happened? I don't hear anymore. Can look like that. that the, the okay, uh, George. Oh. Sorry, we 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 missed uh, some seconds. So maybe your your sentence has not been received. Yeah. Sorry, you Luca. Repeat. I will repeat because I saw I saw my uh, I just saw that my connection was unstable. So it's a Petrokalerkin approach, right? So this is yes. a Petrokalerkin. Okay. Yeah. So so we like the nonlinear space. I will explain why we like the nonlinear space because the nonlinear space. Jin Shao Shu from Penn State showed that uh, rigorously that uh, it, it, uh, it uh, basically is equivalent to adaptive uh, linear finite element if you, if you use a relu and so on. Here, to answer your question, um, the, 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 what, what we want is to integrate by parts uh, because then we have lower derivatives. And if you have a lower derivative, the neural network is a smaller size. Remember I show you the neural network and then next to it I show you uh, another neural network which I couldn't actually visualize because it's the derivatives of the neural network. Every time you take a derivative of a neural network, the depth of the composite neural network doubles. So if I, if I, if I start with 10 layers and I have a second order, I go 10, 20, 40. So I have 40 layers. It's very difficult to, to train a deep neural network. And there's the also difficulties with optimization, like this dying neural network that I show you. So when you do this variational principle, so for example, if you have a functional, and some people like Wine and Nee and others have tried that, uh, if, or, or, or if you do like Can Hilliard, when we do Can Hilliard in phase fields now, we um, minimize directly the functional. Here, you min minimizing the variational form is advantageous from that point of view. Of course, there's also a disadvantage because you have to compute the integrals and you have to, so you, you introduce structure grids and so on. And I wanted to, to get away from that. So the, the way I compute the integral here is based on, not, not on this example, because this example, I can do everything analytical, a single layer, and I use here a sign as a test function. But usually I use like a Legendre polynomials. You can use uh, all sorts of, you can use ReLU. If you use ReLU as a, um, as a function here, you can see the, you, you get the equivalent of, fi of finite element or, or, or Petrogalerkin finite element here. So, so the advantage is that you go to lower derivatives and therefore you can train much, much faster. The accuracy is also therefore better. Uh, the uh, disadvantage is that you still have to deal with integration rules. Um, my NVIDIA uh, uh, folks are doing the, in, all the, the integration using Monte Carlo, for example. Uh, and they throw lots of points at it and so on. But, but um, I, I, I show this here uh, to kind of intrigue people because I know a lot of my friends there work on finite elements and they can think of, uh, of this. Uh, the theory is difficult because you have to do like best of space and, and things like that, but, uh, but it's kind of interesting also. So, so that, that's, uh, uh, that's the answer. Thank you very much. Okay, so now is Paolo, and then uh, there is Francesco Regazzoni and uh, Ivan Fumagalli. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Paolo Antonietti. First of all, uh, thanks, George, for the great talk. So my question goes back to, again, to the domain decomposition approach you, you told us. So if I understand correctly, it is based on 
overlapping approach. So I was wondering whether um, it, it, it might be have sense or it might be useful to think to uh, overlapping or uh, approaches or even more prospectively to, to, to couple this with multi-level uh, approaches. Thank you. Right, right. That, that's an excellent question because um, um, we, we were thinking along these lines also overlap domains like smarts and, and so on because in the beginning and then then we realized one thing which is really interesting. So uh, let me take you back to um, a standard neural network. When I approximate a function from zero to, one, to uh, zero to 10, let's say, right? It turns out that I do pretty well at not just 10, but maybe 10.1. In other words, I go out of the, outside the domain, but, but for a little bit, I, go, I do really well. And the same thing, not just uh, at zero, but my minus 0.1, my approximation is pretty good. So when we did this, uh, and then I uh, domain decomposition, uh, and then I use uh, test functions, uh, local test functions, and then I look at the, so I could approximate the function locally. So it's in this VPIN paper that we have. If you trace it, you will see some of the experiments. We see that actually we have continuity at the boundary, not just of the function, but also of the derivatives of the high deriv of, the, of the derivatives. So then, then, then you realize that that actually uh, the the uh, what we do in finite elements, we do the direct stiffness assembly to have con uh, continuity and go here. You get that for free. You just stitch together. You really just need to, to stitch it together because you have this continuity. So that was something interesting. So then we said, maybe obviously we don't need overlapping domain because, because I, or I said earlier that uh, neural networks, you cannot extrapolate, but extra, you can extrapolate a little bit outside the domain. Maybe people say 5%, 1%, 10%, but even 1%, if you extrapolate outside the domain, you can imagine that you're already good in the domain next door, right? So, so, so that, that's what sort of discourages us of, of, um, from the approximation point of view to go to overlap domains. But, but maybe um, I could see uh, cases where this could uh, make the method more robust. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't discourage you looking in that direction. Uh, and, and also the multi-level method that you mentioned. I, I, find, um, I find lots of uh, the things that, that I did in the past, I can use them here. Uh, and uh, with a caveat, of course, that that none of this is very rigorous yet, but, but some of these ideas, domain decomposition ideas, I, I think, um, and, and you guys, there's a, uh, you have expertise in, in this type of methods. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, uh, I, I would encourage you to, to proceed with this idea uh, with a student or somebody, you know, but, but, uh, but it's, it's not a bad idea. Uh, we didn't proceed with that, although we thought about it because of, of, of our findings at that time. Francesco? So thank you very much for, for this very interesting talk. And so you said that uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, techniques, uh, the pins, uh, borrow some tools from another field, which is the, the field of uh, data science, say, uh, machine learning. And you also said that these two fields uh, have uh, very different features. Uh, about the amount of physics, um, the amount of data involved. And so my question is, uh, uh, how mature is uh, this transition uh, of these tools uh, from uh, one field uh, to the other field? So for instance, uh, you mentioned about the issues about uh, uh, review, and I'm also thinking about the, uh, the optimizers, because uh, in data science, uh, Adam is very popular, for instance, but um, up to my little experience, it looks like when you move to uh, scientific machine learning, it's better to move to LDFGS or Levenmer Marcard or to other optimizer for which uh, maybe computational efficiency is not prior issue, but uh, accuracy is uh, a, a, a major issue. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 I mean, yeah, th th yeah, this is a good question. So let me, let me first of all, uh, say something here, which is um, it's not a theorem that I have, but it's an axiom, uh, and I and I and I work with many many people, uh, and I can tell you with norm one, I have never seen accuracy better than ten to the minus five in in um, solving PDEs. Okay, so and and the reason is because 
the optimizer, and, and let me tell you how we do the optimizer. We start with Adam, and then towards the end, when we drop the loss function less than 10 to the minus three, we go to, um, uh, to LBFGS. So that's, that's a standard thing that we have introduced, and, and uh, it, you try that, it will be very effective, because LB, LBFGS, if you're far away, you cannot, really, you cannot converge. But Adam is very robust and converges, but it doesn't give you the accuracy that you said. So, so you start with Adam and you continue. But we did something, at least for training, which I think, uh, so, so to answer your question, yes, we import a lot of things, but also we started giving back to the community, to the, to the uh, for example, we developed these adaptive activation functions, which I briefly mentioned. So the adaptive activation function, as you can see here, I introduced this NA, N is my parameter, but A, I make it a hyperparameter. So if I change A, you can see here, I can change the slope. Of, of my activation function, right? If it's a ReLU or it's a, it's a hyperbolic tension and so on. So now I make A being a hyperparameter, okay? N is a factor that I, I choose like to see how fast, how much I want to, it's still empirical, how much I want to push this, like a factor of 10 or five or so on. But the thing of A being a hyperparameter, just like the weights and the, um, uh, the weights and the bias. So now I have not weights and bias, but also I have these slopes of my activation functions, how steep I want it. And every neuron can have its own activation function. You can have one everywhere, or you can have every layer. I, I, we like the layers. And now I work with a, a, a postdoc from CSAIL from MIT, and we came up with a theorem. Let me see if I have the theorem here. Oh, here. Here's a theorem about activate. Uh, the, the paper will appear soon. It's in the archive, but it will appear soon in the uh, Proceedings of Royal Society. So basically we prove that with adaptive activation functions uh, for any neural network, not just pins, we avoid bad minima. You see here, not only that, but having adaptive activation function at the layer level or, or neuron level, it's equivalent to second order methods like my, Michael uh, Jordan and others are doing, but nobody's using uh, second order methods because you, you need the Hessian. Having adaptive activation function costs you nothing. So, we found that using adaptive activation functions for training, especially at the, uh, and, and something else we call slope recovery, can give you a speed up factor of a hundred, and sometimes a thousand, in, in some cases if the problem is very steep, without pay, paying the cost, because yes, you have extra activation functions, but let's say if it's layer-wise, it costs you nothing. Well, at the same time, you improve the accuracy second order. We have another theorem now, we haven't published yet, where you see these activation functions. So what we did so far, we changed the slope and we found tremendous results. In fact, in the paper, we, it's not only for pins, but we also use it for NIST, CIFAR, CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, and we beat everyone on the training. We beat any, anybody who has any method. I don't care what they, uh, they use as optimizer. Adaptive activation functions beat them. Now, another thing we did, which gave us another boost is, instead of just changing this here, we also perturb the ends, the minus one and one or the zero and ones. We perturb them with some sign with very, very small sinusoid. So for my activation function look like that. And for, for, for many years now, people have seen that if you, if you train with noise is better because it's more robust. So now we put that in, in the adaptive activation function. So we basically let the data and the PDE and the stiffness and the multiscale decide what these activation functions are. So this way we accelerate the, the, our optimizer, whatever our optimizers are, while at the same time we don't have to pay for Hessian. In fact, when we, when we do this, when we add these fluctuations, we have a theorem that shows that we are equivalent to a third order correction in the steepest descent. Not just a Hessian, but, but a gradient to the cube. So we bypass the cost where well, we get the benefit using adaptive activation functions. So, so what I'm saying is we import a lot of stuff from computer science. Of course, all these optimizers, which are for free, we use them, we don't have to think about it. But actually, because of having to deal with multiscale multi -scale problems and stiff problems, PDs, we came up with this. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to do the, the, um, the ultrasound problem that I show you without activation functions. In fact, none of the other teams were able to do it. I hope I answered your question. It's a long answer, but I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you perfect. Your... Thank you very much. But, but try a, a adaptive activation function. If, if, you, if you can, I have one or two lines code you can get for this. 
Thank you. Okay, so I will, I will take the last question from uh, Ivan Magalli. Okay, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, good morning and thank you very much for the very interesting talk and remarkable results that you, that you presented. Um, my question is actually uh, related in some sense to what uh, you were uh, discussing now, uh, in the sense that uh, it's related to the speed of convergence of uh, the, uh, let's say, training of the neural network. Uh, you presented different results uh, about uh, the convergence of the um, generalization error and also some other components. But uh, I was wondering if you have some uh, insight on the speed in terms of, uh, let's say, number of epochs uh, that you need in order to reach uh, some uh, level of accuracy, at least uh, in a probabilistic uh, sense, I say. Ah, okay. I have to bring you the bad news. Re remember, remember the, um, so for, for, I was talking about training, not, uh, uh, and, and also I, I already, I made a disclaimer to, to, to Alfie about forward problems. So let me show you again. Um, like so, uh, so, so, so remember the problem I showed with the um, uh, solid mechanics problem. There's a hole there. Yeah. Okay. So, so that problem, uh, we, of course, we use Abacus to, um, to check the solution. Of course, use the results uh, to solve the inverse problem. So for the forward problem, well, we first we, we did the forward problem. Let's say you have a hole. What are the forces and so on compared with Abacus? In terms of accuracy, we match Abacus very well, 1%, 1% accuracy or better compared to Abacus. In terms of cost, uh, it took us half an hour and uh, Abacus, it was about, I would say less than a minute. <laughs> so, so it was, we were, were basically 50 times slower than Abacus for the forward problem. Now, we try to solve the inverse problem, I show you. If you have the data, some data at sensors on the boundary, uh, how long will it take Abacus and how long will it take us? For us, because the inverse problem is exactly like the forward problem, it still takes us half an hour. Uh, actually, uh, uh, less because we have data. So every time you have real data, you accelerate the um, problem. So, so less than half an hour. For Abacus, we never been able to complete uh, the, the, because of the uh, unknown topology. Uh, it takes months to do it. So, uh, and that's sort of, I would say, a general conclusion. We did Navier Stokes, we did ter turbulence recently, we did a DNS of turbulence in the channel. Uh, we are basically a thousand times slower than spectral methods on DNS. But if I am interested in LES and I'm tr trying to find the best subgrid model, I can do it very, very quickly compared to any other, anything out, is out there. So at this point, uh, and knowing what I know from other methods and so on, and, and there's no method that I didn't work on, uh, I would say for forward problems, I would, unless I have noisy data and so on, I would not use pins. But for any inverse problem where you're trying to find parameters, where, where you're trying to find, uh, where you have noisy data, where you're trying to find functions, where you're trying to find the equation, I would use pins. I have an example uh, in, in the archive, in the bio archive, it's called bio pins. So it's a, from, from, from systems biology. Uh, I have seven equations, uh, 12, 12 parameters are unknown. I only know the dynamics of two species, the reactive transport, let's say, coagulation cascade, Alfio. So I know the dynamics for two using the, inver using the pins I can, and sort of the inverse mixed mode, I can solve for the dynamics of the other five Plus, I can find the parameters at the same time. Now, if I knew all the parameters and I was solving the forward problem, I would be very slow compared to others. But in this, in this mixed problem, where I don't know some of the parameters, and I, I, I also want to infer fields, I think I'm faster, much faster than anything else. So I don't know if that summarizes, but, but, but I, I don't want you to think that drop what you're doing, drop Abacus, drop your finite element, drop your, your, your flow solvers, and, and, and uh, and flock to pins, not unless you have noisy data, not unless you have inverse or mixed problems, not unless you're trying to discover something. Is that clear? I mean, I, yeah. I just, I, 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 I sounded too enthusiastic, so I, I wanted to, <laughs> to contain a little much. bit the, the, the hype. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I think it's time to stop and uh, to give uh, George a break because uh, after this fantastic talk, uh, he answers so uh, 
uh, deeply to uh, very many questions. Uh, so, George, thank you for enriching our culture today and uh, for giving us so many uh, stimuli to pursue with our job. Uh, and we feel a bit uh, depressed from one side. On the other side, we feel very stimulated. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, we will contribute to uh, further enhancing the uh, uh, understanding uh, and, uh, and the development of this very fascinating uh, branch of science. So, thank, thank you very much. You. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I, my, uh, I accepted to give this early talk because, of course, uh, um, I have lots of friends uh, here in, in Milano, I know, but also because I, I, I really wanted to people to think about this domain decomposition and uh, maybe some of the theory and so on that is lacking. And, uh, and, and you know, I wanted to give you like a um, potpourri of all the applications and so on. Uh, lots of industries do lots of different things, geophysics and so on. But, but uh, I think uh, the applied math has a huge role to play. I, I really do, actually. Uh, we are like the, the circus in applied mathematics. Remember, the, it's not an applied in finite elements, circus of finite elements, where people would go around and, and claim whatever they wanted at that, at that time. But, but at the end, what I show here is some sort of least squares finite elements, right, combined with data yeah. and new optimizers and so yeah, on. Sure. But, uh, but it's really least squares finite elements in some sense. And uh, so, so, uh, there's some good things about it, some bad things, and so on. But 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 I believe that a lot of this uh, in your audience here, a lot of people will, will pick on it, and and uh, we'll meet again to talk about it. Sure. Okay. So thank you very much again, and let me thank also all the uh, many participants who have been uh, uh, there until the very end. Thank you very much, uh, George, and uh, have a good day. Yes. Yeah. You too. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.